Well, thank you very much, uh, panelists. And uh, we're going to now move into our uh, last uh, panel of the day, which is uh, a very clear continuation of what we've just been talking about. And this next panel will focus on uh, oversight and information sharing. We've already had some uh, discussion of that, uh, chaired by uh, Hugh Siegel uh, from our uh, friends across the way at Massey College. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel who will be focusing on oversight information sharing. And as soon as we're ready, we will begin. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we are now going to get to the... Uh part of the discussion that deals with who watches the watchers and why does it matter and are we doing a good job of it and um, what are the issues that are raised by the post-Paris mindset around the issue of who watches the, wa wa the watchers. Um, we have Professor Lisa Austin, an Associate Professor of Law at the Center for Innovation and Policy, Professor Ron Diebert, Director of the Citizen Lab, and Professor Ron Levy, Director of the Master of Global Affairs Program at the Ignatiev Chair of Peace, Conflict Studies. Um, I will, merely in the uh, context of mea culpa, lay out my 30 seconds worth of bias, because they're on the public record, so nobody can then allege that I'm not being properly and fair-minded in view of not having shared with you my biases. So seven years ago, um, I introduced the first motion with respect to statutory oversight for our uh, national security bodies and have continued to be on the side of doing that long before C-51 was ever introduced. Um, rationale was simple. All our democratic allies, NATO, the United States, France, Germany, the United Kingdom, have some measure of statutory legislative oversight. They do it with discretion and prudence. They found a way to do it. The notion that somehow as a democracy we are unable to do it just strikes me as odd and hard, almost impossible to explain. Secondly, um, when I chaired the uh, Senate Committee on Anti-Terrorism, we did in 2007 uh, and subsequently in 2011 make a series of recommendations which did take into very serious consideration the Air India inquiry and some of its recommendations and the concern of, um, of uh, Mr. Just Mr. Justice Major relative to the incompetence of CSIS in transmitting information effectively to the police in a timely fashion and the incompetence of the police in dealing in a timely way with the information they got from CSIS. Hundreds of Canadians died unnecessarily because of that incompetence. There was also a very strong recommendation that there be a statutory basis for the work of the National Security Advisor, that it not just be appointed on the Executive Council Act, the Government of Canada, but there be a law indicating what his or her role is, what their statutory responsibilities were. That would, of course, allow some measurement of their performance against those statutory requirements. And as we sit here, we do not have that. And um, thirdly, we did take the view, and here's where I suspect I'll get into most trouble with people in the room, in our last report that because of what Mr. Justice Major had said, CSIS uh, and other surveillance agencies should have the authority, in fact, to lawfully um, disrupt terrorist activities from taking place. Now, lawfully is a, is a very broad frame of reference, um, and I must say my initial response to the provisions in C-51 is that by putting in some judicial constraints on how that disruption might go forward, the government has given that proposition some reasonable thought under the circumstances, although not sufficient. I'm going to um, ask the uh, actual members of the panel uh, uh, to, uh, to respond to a few uh, questions, and I'm going to start, if I may, with Lisa Austin. I wonder, Lisa, if you could just share with us your view on the actual information sharing provisions in C-51. Um, are there problems with them? Are they producing more difficulties than they are producing benefit? And um, are all the problems just because of lack of oversight, or are there other problems as well? Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I want to just walk through a few things about the information sharing portion of Bill C-51, because I think it also illustrates 
um, the issue of oversight, which is you can't just talk about oversight, you have to talk about the sort of underlying norms, what's the, being accomplished by this act, um, if there's not enough protection of rights, and, and Kent Roach and Craig Farsese have done a great job of, of looking at this um, in general, then you know, oversight isn't going to get you the protections that seem to be cl being claimed for it um, in um, the sort of uh, media um, discussions of this. So what are the information sharing portions of this bill trying to do? There's one way you can put it, and this would be sort of what, what some of the rhetoric is, is the information sharing is, is important. As we've heard, there's been so many inquiries, a major um, commission, a RAR commission, who have talked about the need for coordinated information sharing in, in the context of terrorism investigations. Absolutely, that's true. That's not what this bill is doing. This bill is doing something quite a bit different and quite a bit more. So what it is is not about information sharing between agencies concerned with national security functions. It's about allowing those 17 recipient institutions under the Act that are listed under the Act to get information from every other government institution. Right? So this is about collecting a vast amount of information. What this is about is authorizing the creation of haystacks. Right? So in the, in the Snowden revelations um, around the NSA activities, what we saw were all sorts of big data techniques being used in national security investigations where you collect a whole pile of information. This isn't about information about necessarily anyone under suspicion. Think about the U.S. phone metadata program right? that's so controversial south of the border. Um, you collect a vast amount of information about people who have done nothing wrong and are under no suspicion. Why? Because you want to then use big data analytic techniques to figure out people you're interested in or other sorts of information. That's precisely what the information sharing provisions allow here. Because what they're allowing is for information sharing either proactively or upon request um, on a standard of relevance which actually is the standard that was used to, to lawfully justify the phone metadata um, collection in the U.S., on a, on a standard of relevance to whether um, it, it's relevant to the functions of the recipient institutions um, in relation to this incredibly broad definition, as Kent pointed out, about activities that undermine um, the security of Canada. So a vast amount of information at stake. This isn't about potentially targeting someone improperly, like putting them under suspicion improperly. We're going to have everyone's information. Any information you share with the government is potentially fair game to be used here. What are they doing? They're creating different sorts of information systems, different sorts of databases, basically different haystacks to be used in a variety of ways. Not only that, I think they're setting it up so they can connect those haystacks, including connect them with foreign partners. There's provisions in the Act that says once that information is shared with one of these 17 recipient institutions, it can be used and further shared by anyone for any purpose. Okay, so, on, and if this sounds a bit crazy, let me say that this is what the Privacy Commissioner of Canada just said on Friday um, in his statement about the Act as well. So, um, that's what it's doing. Now, are, what are the protective norms? Well, the government says the Privacy Act applies. Okay, so you think, well, there's some privacy protection there. Well, what does the Privacy Act do in terms of protecting privacy? It says, well, when a government in, um, uh, is collecting information in relation to a program, it should collect it directly from an individual. It should tell them the purposes for which it's collecting that information. And it should be restricted in its use and further disclosure of that information. You can only do it for the purposes collected um, unless you fit within some of the exceptions. And when you're in the national security context or even just the routine law enforcement context, you're in all the exceptions. The Privacy Act allows for a right of access to your own personal information to know what the government collected about you and to correct for inaccuracies, except when you're in the law enforcement and national security context. So it's already an incredibly deeply flawed privacy paradigm for this context. What does the Bill C-51 accomplish? What it does is allow for a particular exception to have incredible purchase. That's one of the exceptions that says where an act of parliament authorizes information sharing, it's fair game, both in terms of use and disclosure. That's what C-51 does. It authorizes the broad information sharing. This is not about the extension of privacy protection. It's about the extension of the exceptions to privacy protection. There's no there there. There are problems with oversight, yes, and we can talk about it. I'll, I'll stop talking and we can come back to that. But I just want to underscore that before we even get to the problem of oversight, 
we don't have any protections against which we're going to use that oversight to have any bite. Um, and so oversight of nothing is still kind of a lot of nothing. Um, I'm going to ask Ron Debert, um, who has been probably delving into the technological issues around mass monitoring and digital communications for a very, very long time, to his credit and to the credit of the broader universe, what is the, what is the core problem in terms of our signals intelligence agency, CSE? What causes you to lose most sleep at night about it, uh, about its operation, and about the degree to which it is under any oversight at all? I know that the oversight is a retired judge and a few folks, but beyond that, what is causing you great grief? Sure, okay. Um, so, you know, so much is unknown about CSC because of secrecy, and some of the secrecy is justified. This is an agency that wasn't officially acknowledged as even existing until 1974, rarely spoken of or acknowledged of in public uh, before 9-11, and before Snowden, I can say from my own personal experience, I give public lectures uh, with the exception of maybe some of the panelists in this event today, very few Canadians e e even heard of CSEC. It's an, it's an, the, by budgetary terms, it's the largest in Canada of, of the intelligence agencies, somewhere around $600 million. Uh, It's got a new billion-dollar headquarters in Ottawa, massive. Um, it has extraordinary capabilities, extraordinary capabilities, that have really been transformed since 9-11, but essentially as a function of the big data universe that Lisa was talking about, some of the algorithm capabilities, and a new philosophy that guides all of this, which in a nutshell we would call collect it all. It's closely allied with the NSA and GCHQ and the other five eyes going back to World War II, and thus has truly global reach. Um, so with respect to C5-1, several concerns stand out for me. One is... Already terrible oversight, made no better, probably made worse. That's one. And what, what do I mean by that? Well, by anyone's estimation, uh, CSC is the worst of the five eyes in terms of oversight, accountability, and review, and those mean different things. You mentioned the C CSE commissioner. It, it is a weak uh, type of review. It's not oversight at all. Office of a retired judge, who, by the way, whose budget has declined while CSEs has grown, um, who issues an annual review that confirms whether or not the government is operating within its legal mandate, which is not independent at all, uh, but is, as Wesley Work has called it, review inside the security tent. Not once in all its years has it found CSE to be doing anything illegal, which sounds nice, but to me that only raises alarm bells. Uh, not once a missing stapler or a few extra pencils purchased or something like that. No, it's always doing very well. Um, that's not to say it's done no good. It's better than nothing, but barely. Uh, the way this CSE is constituted, it can operate and justify what it is doing on the basis of secret interpretations of secret laws, such as ministerial authorizations. On this basis, it can describe what is clearly mass surveillance of all Canadians as being not in violation of its legal mandate because it has its own definitions of the terms targeting, or directed at, or incidental, all of which are contrary to common sense and Oxford English dictionary senses of the term. For example, right now, you talked about telephone metadata in the United States, but right now in our own country, CSE can and does collect, analyze, use, retain bulk metadata communications concerning communications and non-communications activities that take place electronically in whole or in part in Canada, regardless of the nationality of the participants, because it defines metadata as not, quote, private communications, right? What is meta metadata? Well, just look at this room. We are, every single person in this room, I'm sure, has a cell phone on right now. And as I've used this example many, many times, right now, even when we're not using it, our cell phone is emitting a pulse, a beacon to the nearest cell phone tower or Wi-Fi router that contains the make and model of the phone the geolocation of the phone, the fact that it's my phone. So CSEC right now has all of that information if it wants, and it can tell that everybody is in this room at the same time. Those are very powerful capabilities. To me, a lot of that is private communications. Uh, incidentally, since the Snowden disclosures, the government has shown no inclination to correct any of uh, 
of this, any of the concerns that its critics had, nothing remotely close to the type of reviews or reforms done in the United States, for example, and has described oversight as, quote, needless red tape. Given that with CSE we're talking about an expansion, with C51, I should say, an expansion of activities and scope and scale of what it is doing, the fact that CSE already has very poor oversight review and accountability mechanisms. This should be very troubling for all Canadians. That's one. Two, it would encourage greater information sharing uh, among government agencies, which, which Lisa talks about. And here I think it's important to understand CSE has three mandates. There's mandate A, which is foreign intelligence, mandate B, which is about protection of, of government communications, and mandate C, which is about assistance, technical assistance to law enforcement. Um, in C51, they're talking about uh, encouraging that and expanding that. And I think how that works in practice is very unclear right now. There have been incidences of, of violations. The, someone mentioned the Justice Mosley case, which I think is very important. But having looked at a lot of Snowden documents and a lot of CSE-related documents, I can tell you there is a real blurring of these boundaries and practices and, it, and within these mandates that's getting increasingly blurred. What counts as domestic? What counts as cyber defense? What counts as foreign intelligence? It's one big basket for them. I think all you have to do is look at the airport Wi-Fi uh, story uh, to reaffirm that. Um, where do they get their data from? The airport Wi-Fi story, again, it was improperly uh, labeled, in my opinion, because most Canadians came away with the assumption that the government had some kind of eavesdropping equipment in Pearson Airport, but that wasn't the case at all. What the government did was they went to the private companies that own and operate the infrastructure, the telecommunications companies, the advertising companies, the web tracking companies, which they call special source, and they got the information from them in one manner or another, how they get that information is very important when we're talking about information sharing among all of these agencies. I should also say that there's a lot of information sharing, including information sharing of Canadian metadata with the five eyes and vice versa. So we don't know anything really except the broad contours of what goes on among the five eyes in terms of the information sharing. It's a black hole. The last concern I have, and for me it's the most important, is this uh, concern around the ramping up of the offensive capabilities of CSC as part of this idea of disrupting uh, foreign terrorist operations or disrupting websites. I think the last panel touched upon this, but really radically underestimated and kind of sanitized what it is that we would be talking about here. Um, when Five Eyes talk about disrupting cyberspace, uh, they, they're talking about something completely different than, you know, legal warrants and please remove this website. Just look at the repertoire of what they have and what our own CSE has in place right now. What we know from the Snowden revelations. CSE operates a huge global botnet, codenamed Landmark. Thousands of computers, as it's commandeered, to undertake computer network attacks and exploitation. Global capabilities. It piggybacks on the very Chinese cyber espionage networks it routinely condemns. It has a huge suite of tradecraft codenamed Warrior Pride, just Google it in the Snowden archives, focused on hacking into mobile devices. CSE was party to the G GCHQ hack into Belgicom routers. It's weakened encryption. It's required the installation of backdoors into our critical infrastructure. It's probably hoarding vulnerabilities known as zero days. So given the wide leeway definition of threats in this bill, this could justify enormous offensive operations, some of them seated by RCMP, CSIS, or other agencies, and it legitimizes an already disturbing militarization of the cyberspace at a time when I believe our interests in the long term would be much better served by putting effort into cyber defense and norms of mutual restraint in cyberspace. So quite separate from C51, I think we're already well past the time when as a society, we need to think of the proper checks and balances around signals intelligence agencies in an era of big data. But looking at this bill, it takes us in a dramatically different direction than in my opinion we need to urgently go right now.
which is in the direction of more rather than less rigorous checks and balances, oversight, review, and public accountability over our signals intelligence agency. Um, I want to come at um, Professor Levy in a slightly different way. We saw numbers the last few weeks that said in one part of Canada 84% of the population was very much in favor of the legislation. Um, I think there is in Canada, for better or for worse, quite a significant measure of trust in the motivation of our police, uh, the motivation of our judicial system, however imperfect both may be. Um, part of what relates, if I may say so, to the way in which this legislation is viewed and the way in which the watchers are viewed is the notion of core motivation and trust in our public institutions. Can you give us your own sense of where this issue should place us on that spectrum and where you think we should be headed? Thank you. Uh, it's impossible to follow Lisa and Ron uh, and discuss issues of privacy and cyber questions uh, in, with any sort of sense of uh, logic or, or uh, being able to provide something new to it. But let me take you in a way to a new place. Uh, I want to push this conversation around oversight to a question around what I think is really the, the complex ecology around what Hugh calls trust in our institutions, uh, as well as the question in that way of information flow in that, pro in that process. And I think that's the, that's the bigger question that's motivating uh, some of this conversation. And I want to pull out what Wesley says. We just don't know when it comes to C-51 yet. I think I want to ask ourselves, well, if we just don't know, we just don't know what the effects would be, we just don't know what the questions are, well, then what do we know empirically around trust institutions, around uh, oversight? And uh, Lisa mentioned uh, Daniel Therrien's uh, piece about big data. Uh, in the context of C-51. And he says, all Canadians, not just terrorism suspects, will be caught in this web. Well, that's interesting, because uh, you know, Ron uh, suggests there, and as does Lisa, sort of the creation of multiple haystacks and the concern that happens when you gather vast amounts of data. But of course, seen from another lens, from another context, seen, for example, from the French context, where one worries about the amalgam more so than about big data, all of a sudden, the collection of information about all Canadians, in contrast to the collection of information about particular groups, is a very different, uh, raises perhaps a very different set of questions and would be regarded politically uh, as very different. So coming to the data that we saw this morning, we see high support for the legislation. We see high support for the information sharing components of the legislation. I hear that they're not uh, all they're cracked up to be in some ways and more than they're cracked up to be in other ways. Uh, but we see all of that, yet what we do see at the same time when we talk about oversight is oversight over conduct. And that's not oversight over information, it's oversight over the conduct of police, of security. And that was where we saw, uh, if anywhere, on the data this morning, some desire for, uh, for more oversight. So what does that tell us? And I want to suggest that there is a, a complex ecology, and we could talk about this more in questions, around trust in institutions and information sharing. The first is that uh, information sharing is not only about policing, but is also about uh, the protection in a way of the homologous group on the other side, those who are either victims or perceive themselves to be potential victims of attacks. And so if we look at the French context, uh, on January 12th, the French government created a new position, a prefect in charge of religious sites, read Jewish sites, uh, to some extent mosques given a different status in the letter of appointment. But that entire position of prefect was not about the creation of more resources. Those resources were already created under the uh, Vigi Pirate system, which was, which was increased tenfold uh, after the attacks. That position was there about community intelligence, was there about working with uh, leaders of religious groups in France, both Jewish and Muslim, it turns out, uh, in order to get information from the community about possible attacks and to use that information to do what? likely to trust build. And so here what we had was the creation of a position that was about community intelligence, brokering of that intelligence, not to create more resources, but to change the dynamic between the state and its citizens, uh, both in this case about victims of attacks, 
Uh, on top of which to create then potential bridges uh, between communities through the flow of information. So I'll leave that as one part of this triangle. We'll come then to what do we know about trust and in institutions when it comes to information about the groups being policed, right? So the other side of this. And so what we know from the empirical literature is that when do people, and this includes Muslims in New York and in London, feel trust in institutions around counterterrorism efforts? When will they, are they more likely to cooperate with the police? When they feel that there's some sense of what's called procedural justice. And that procedural justice, it turns out, is not so much uh, about information sharing and the concerns over information sharing. It is in the moment. It is the capacity in the moment to have voice. It is the capacity in the moment to sense that your police officer in front of you is acting neutrally in this some sense, some respect, and some level of trust. Now, I will just a sidebar on this, and I'll close soon. Um, in regular policing, coming to Lisa's distinction, the legitimacy of the police, which would include the sense of oversight over information and so on, has some effect on people's perception of the legitimacy of that encounter and their willingness to cooperate. That tends to wash away <clears throat> when it comes to the willingness to cooperate in these cases. So interestingly, when it comes to counterterrorism, it is really the police officer in front of you, the judge in front of you, the uh, state agent in front of you that builds trust in institutions. There's less of an effect for a uh, general sense of legality and propriety. It's there. I'm not going to say it's not there, but it's not the dominant theme if we're thinking about uh, the ecology in this way of trust in institutions and how that might work. So all of this might give us some purchase on those data. Last point on oversight. What we know does matter in these uh, is less so judicial oversight by a retired judge who rarely finds a missing stapler, but more so consultation and consideration with groups that see themselves as being potentially targets of legislation in the drafting of the legislation. That is seen as procedurally important. That is seen as building confidence and trust in institutions. And so rather than our tendency to think of oversight in a way on the back end, are we going to look for the missing stapler? Was the information sharing proper or not proper? It is in the design uh, where we find that consultation provides, uh, can generate the kind of confidence that can then lead both to cooperation and efficacy, if you think of it in those terms, as well as legitimacy and uh, a sense of propriety of what's going on. Thank you. Um, let me ask panelists this question, if I can, um, and it's about our present context and the broader history of watching the watchers that has been either part of or not part of the Canadian tradition. When the legislation was brought in after 911 by the Chrétien administration, there were several folks who went to the officials, including the Deputy Prime Minister and McClellan and the Deputy Minister of Justice, to say if there was ever a time to bring in a piece of legislation notwithstanding the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, this is the time because the rights, rights will be impacted there will be deep problems, and at least you'll be sending a signal that this is temporary, and we know that it's temporary. The response that was given universally was, well, actually, this is completely charter-proof. Don't concern your little mind about it. It's going to be just fine. And then a whole bunch of us, with the help of people like um, some of the panelists that we had earlier today, spent a good part of uh, the mid-night 2007, Kent Roach and and Wesley Wark and others, redrafting that legislation on renewal to make it consistent with the decisions that were made by the Charter, under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, because the document was substantially not charter-proof, and various parts of it were struck down by various courts. Um, are, we not, are we not, in a sense, prejudging the way in which this legislation will ultimately operate by assuming that it will survive any legal challenge? Is it not realistic to assume that almost within the first 12 months of the, of the act being proclaimed, there will be legal challenges, and those legal challenges will begin to define and prescribe the way in which that legislation operates? Or is that a naive assumption on our part, which kind of gets us away from the core question of trying to make the present draft before us as perfect as possible? Who wants to start? Lisa, I think you should start. <laughs> 
I'm happy to start. Um, I think w one of the, the problems with these kind of claims of, of legislation being charter-proof, particularly um, in this area and particularly with the current government, is that they seem to operate on the assumption that unless there's a clear red light, like it's absolutely certain that this is not compliant with the charter, um, that it's a go. Right? It's a go. They turn what is gray into a green light, actually. Um, and so there, there are lots of things in the legislation that I think you can make very strong um, and credible claims that um, are not compliant with the charter. There are other aspects of the proposed Bill C-51 that might be more in a gray area um, with respect to its compliance with the charter. If you say that actually um, it's charter proof in this incredibly narrow sense that seems to be operative um, and currently, then what you do is you put the burden on other groups to mount lengthy, costly challenges through the court rather than having the discussion up front about about what our civil liberties should look like in this context, which you know connects with what Ron was saying about the front end design and how we feel about um, legislation, institutions, and, and, and actions in this context. So, interestingly enough, um, whenever the charter proof assertion is made by law officers of the Crown, parliamentarians of all affiliations say, "Would you be good enough to share with us?" <laughs> the opinion that you gave the minister about why this is charter proof, and of course that's advice to cabinet and can never be shared. And in fact, I think it was Janet Hebert, who was head of political studies at Queen's some years ago, who argued in a very thoughtful um, uh, monograph that there should be a standing committee on the Charter of Rights in every legislature and parliament through which every piece of legislation has to pass, so at least the public would understand in some detail what the issues are. Um, we're not surprised that that idea has not been taken up by any of our our legislatures. Um, go ahead, Ron. So this is utter heresy, and I apologize to all of you in the room, but we, we often mistake, um, well, I think the example of procedural justice is a good one. There is a notion we have that if but the public understood the charter questions, uh, that would, in fact, be the, uh, the decisive factor. Um, I'm not as convinced. Partly we know uh, from the uh, empirical data on policing that the public may have wildly different perceptions of the legitimacy of the criminal justice system and the legitimacy of the police. And so the public is very uh, capable of holding two thoughts at once. Uh, who knew? And it can hold the thought that this is a good idea and hold the thought uh, that it may or may not be charter-proof and may not seek to always reconcile those things. And I, uh, I only worry by the sort of the, the, the alternation we get into, which is a desire to say, gee whiz, uh, you know, there are charter problems and thus it will be seen as illegitimate. I'm not entirely sure those things run together and I'm not entirely sure, uh, and I suspect actually that the data we saw this morning uh, support me on that implicitly. Ron, um can we talk for a moment about privacy? Because it's clearly at the center of the concerns which you shared earlier about the degree to which metadata and other issues can be mined without any significant oversight or with rules that are very vague. Um, we now see uh, organizations like Google and others engaging to allow, to make sure that their client base is able to make use of their facility without having it in some way broken into by government and other uh, affiliation so that their privacy, the privacy of their client base can be protected, which is legitimate. We have seen the private sector engaged in some circumstances, not always outside the law, but not necessarily completely within it, in the sharing of information, megadata, um, big data, and various other things for purposes as nefarious as marketing and product design and all the rest. How do you make a distinction? Is the distinction between the invasion of privacy here about the purpose for which it's being invaded, or who's doing the invading? Uh, because I think from the point of view of the average Canadian, knowing that their bank data might end up in the hands of a credit agency without them having known, or in the hands of an insurance selling piece of a bank without them knowing, might be as troubling as the fact that they were using Wi-Fi at Pearson on their way down to the Caymans, and somebody was able to monitor that as part of a large data set. Uh, you know, that's a very good question. I, I think 
just within the span of a few short years, really within this decade, uh, we've gone through this extraordinary change in how we communicate, and, and as individuals, we leave this enormous digital exhaust everywhere we go that doesn't disappear, it doesn't just go off into the ether, it sits on computers and servers and in cables and routers and so on, and all of that is owned and operated by the private sector. Um, what the private sector does with all of that data is very important and often has uh, important legal components to it in terms of um, the conditions that we attach to the use of their services and what we expect of them as stewards and custodians of our data. And I wouldn't minimize that at all because um, there are enormous privacy violations and, and really poor practices in the industry that I could cite one after the other that would horrify people. At the same time, though, I think there's a categorical distinction between when the state has access to that data and the private sector has access to the data and what we do with it. And here, <clears throat> I've always argued not to, to minimize privacy advocates, but for me, the big concern is not privacy per se. Maybe that's not the right way to frame it um, because people are now accustomed to giving away so much of their privacy as part of their daily lives. It's about the potential for the abuse of power if that power is not properly checked and balanced. And I think of it from the perspective of, of classical liberal political philosophy. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a parliamentarian. Uh, I'm, I'm someone who comes from a, a political theory background. And I think about it in terms of the classic architecture of what's required to prevent um, the concentration of power in the hands of a, of a few small people. And, and what type of abuses that could lead to. Uh, I was recently returning from a trip, and I was uh, there was a HBO documentary on on the Nicks, on some new Nixon tapes. And I, I think I've said this before. I think the Watergate episode should really be required study for students, just to see how recently you could have such horrible abuses of power, including uh, the machinery of government and the intelligence apparatus um, by one person and a small group of people surrounding this person. Um, you know, that's not to say it's going on now, but if you look at the, the system we have in place right now in terms of oversight, review, and accountability, in my opinion, it's structurally flawed as a liberal democracy. And that's a big problem when you look down the horizon where the vast majority of the world's population is coming from weak states, fragile states, authoritarian regimes. How are we going to uh, make the case for the protection of basic rights and freedoms down the road if we can't even get our own house in order? Uh, when it comes to oversight and review of CSEC, CSIS, and so on, I think we, we need to be discussing something much more radical than something like, you know, uh, CERC or the CSE commissioner or even parliamentary uh, oversight of the type that, that you uh, and others have talked about in Ottawa. You know, I don't mean to insult Ottawa as a city, but whenever I go there, I feel a little creeped out. Like this is a, a, a city that's full of government people who speak to each other and it's like a different world. And um, I think, really, we need some type of outside accountability, outside of the Ottawa culture. Something radical in terms of maybe an ombuds office or uh, some type of commissioner uh, that's not part of that culture. Because we're living in radically different times in terms of the volume of communications that, that, that are out there and what could be done to abuse it if, if we don't watch, um, watch the government properly. Yeah, um, I just wanted to to echo a little bit about what what Ron was saying. I agree with him about the abuse of power um, issue. I think that that's always actually been part of the analysis in in privacy law, particularly under the Charter. Um, but I think that part of the issue is trying to figure out what is an abuse of power or what is a violation of privacy. And when you have these sort of big data techniques, the the impact of any particular collection on any particular individual looks very minimal. And it might be the kind of thing that you say, well, I don't care if someone knew I was connecting to the Wi-Fi at, at Pearson um, International Airport. And what I think we need to shift to, um, and this is what I think the oversight needs to connect with, is that what we're dealing with are information systems, right? We're dealing with the, the collection of a lot of it of information is being collected for a particular purpose, used in a particular kind of way, shared um, and connected 
connected to other databases with allies um, in general. How are these set up? Right? How do we assess the effectiveness of them as systems? How do we catalog on that kind of broad scale what the overall impact on privacy and civil liberty is and how we think this is consistent with free and democratic norms? How do we balance those? How do we audit these information systems? How do we reassess them? Um, and how do we avoid a kind of unilateralism in making decisions about them um, to the extent that, that we do? Are we going to just have right, the government's interpretation of, of their effectiveness? Do we have some sort of external review. This is technical, it's legal, it's a number of things, but we have to be dealing with it on the system level. And when you look at C51, we don't even, it's not even clear from the face of it that that's what they're doing. It's just those of us who've been watching what they're doing as various revelations come out and then read the bill say, oh, that's what they're doing. Um, the government's not being upfront about this, and they're not building in any way to track this and, and, and look at it. And I think you can't get at the privacy or abuse questions unless you start doing that. Uh, I'm struck, and, and Lisa and Ron would know more about this than I would, but uh, as you move, as one moves to big data techniques, as one moves to 17 organizations that one would share data with, um, the the collections. I, I think I'm going to take back what I said earlier in terms of there being no uh, no amalgam, no 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 accum accumulation of a group. It's just the groups presumably are now created inductively from the data, and so there are the groups of people who have these kinds of patterns. Well, that doesn't easily fit with our ideas about minority communities being policed, for instance, because the group is itself now created inductively rather than from uh, ethnicity, let's say, or from race. In that situation, I would then, I'd like to actually, I don't want to uh, usurp your chairship, Hugh, but um, I'd like to hear Ron's thinking on what a review would look like, because I know what review would look like in a situation of domestic policing where you have, let's say, in a post-Ferguson world, uh, increased attention to civilian review, we know what is implicit there and explicit, which would be civilians that look like the population being policed. But once the population being policed is a collection that's produced through big data techniques each time, I'm not entirely sure what that would look like to have a representative review panel if the, the collections of people are changing their change, in a sense, through the inductively. Is that a fair question? Well, I, I, my opinion is pretty basic. I think you need to have um, something more than a retired judge that issues an annual review that is really, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, something that is 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 done for the benefit of the Minister of Defense and given to Parliament in redacted form. You need some kind of proper uh, review that is done independent of. Uh, the security tent itself, first of all. I think you need meaningful oversight because what the CSE commissioner does is not oversight. That's, that's review. Um, so what does that oversight look like? Well, I think we could at least look south of the border in terms of the, the type of mechanisms that are in place there in terms of oversight judges and you know having to go and something so basic as a warrant um, being important to the process of collecting information. Um, when it comes to big data, I think <clears throat> maybe there are ways in which the very algorithms themselves could be used to provide some sorts of some sort of checks and balance. Um, and again, I think that some of that might exist in, in the NSA's capabilities that we don't necessarily have on our own. You have to really go through the Snowden disclosures, and of course others are privy to that stuff that I'm not. Um, but I think that like I said before, there has to be some extra teeth that comes outside of, of the culture of Ottawa that is um, separate from, from the, the, the system that exists there and the, and the culture there because um, I feel that it's, it's very much an inside bubble and, and the same people go through that and I, I think we need to rethink that somehow and I'm, I'm not expert enough to know what that looks like. Other people can probably come up with better ideas I just know that when you look at the accumulation of material that's been disclosed just about CSEC, I mean, spend a good day. A lot has been released from the Snowden disclosures. Just spend a day looking at, at what our agency is capable of and what it can do. I think it would really surprise people. And um, this is not 
it, it's not congruent with what the explanations are publicly and the defenses of it that are given by public officials. It's entirely different. It's like a different universe that they're talking about. I mean, how can you collect all metadata of all com communications in Canada and not call that private communications, as you were talking about before, with the, the type of power that you have at your disposal to analyze all that data and say it's not targeting Canadians simply because an individual Canadian is not selected out. I heard the same argument from a former GCHQ director. He admitted at least, yes, we collect everything, but it's not surveillance until an analyst looks at it. Right? That's their definition of it. Just a kind of counterfactual context for a moment. Um, the Americans have a pretty intense oversight. They also, in those committees, have budgetary control. The difference between the Americans and the Canadians is that if a Canadian government is a majority government, it does not require particular parliamentary committees to give them the financing they need to run the security agencies because they will have the numbers uh, to get their budgetary estimates through on a regular basis. Where in the American context, part of why they do have to listen to these oversight groups because they do have significant budgetary control over the very agencies that they oversee. Um, all of our allies have this oversight. They have a way of watching the watchers, however imperfect it may be, and it is uh, rooted in their democratic systems. None of our agency heads, not the head of CSIS, not the head of CSEC, not the head of military intelligence, not the head of the RCMP, None of them have ever said they don't want parliamentary oversight or civilian oversight, quite the contrary. They've all said, providing it's prudently done, we think it's a good thing, our allies do it. Um, when the present prime minister was the leader of the opposition and a proposal came forward from the Martin government for parliamentary oversight, he supported it. What is it, in your judgment, what do you think, if you can put your mind in the, in the head of whoever's giving any particular prime minister advice, what is it that they would be saying to, to make them believe that a level of parliamentary oversight of any kind would be somehow deleterious to the public interest? What, I mean, what, what is, if you assume for a moment on the motivational side that any prime minister of any affiliation is trying to do what he or she thinks is right for the country, they may be wrong, but they believe they think they're doing something that's right for the country. What is the kind of advice you, you would understand the technical issues that they would get that would say, here's why you do not want parliamentary oversight. Well, Aside from I, I'd rather hear your opinion on that. <laughs> <laughs> My opinion clearly had zero impact on that, Ron, when I was there. Uh, I, I, I will say this. I think the notion that it's bureaucratic and red tape is, uh, is a complete kind of filler for a more substantive discussion around oversight. But if you, if, you, if you expect that they're saying that with some measure of conviction, there's got to be some reason that they're saying it. Or do we just think it's, it's a desire not to share that part of the security management system with other parties in the House of Commons, despite the fact that in the United States and France and the United Kingdom and Germany and Italy and Belgium, they do that, and Holland, they do that. Why would, why would they think that Canada has to be an outlier on the issue of parliamentary oversight involving a multi-party process. What would be the benefit in someone taking that, what appears to be, in my view, narrow and, and not very constructive view? I can't figure out what it is. I just don't know what it is. I mean, isn't there an obvious answer that it's, you know, as long as you can go without an, uh, unnecessarily tying your hands, why would you do anything? Why would you support anything like that? And the, the polls seem to support that Canadians are not really too concerned about, you know, the Snowden disclosures, Ron, unfortunately. So I accept that. I push for it. But when you look at how the various oversight bodies, the British Committee of Parliamentarians on National Security, the committees in Washington, responded to the metadata issue, they all came out in defense of the security agencies that have been engaged in metadata work. They all said this had been reviewed by us, we think their understanding and their appropriate their approach was substantive, but it was also lawful. And we, you know, so they're also losing that measure of defense for some of the things that will be done, which by definition will be controversial. Anyway, nobody can figure out why they're so stupid. Is that it? That's. <laughs> can I um can I ask each one of you now to offer perhaps a final reflection on where we should go from here, on the watching the watchers proposition. 
Ron, I'll let you start this time. I would, um, I would reframe that debate to be one about efficacy rather than about concerns over privacy. Uh, partly that comes, that's strategic, uh, but that comes from the data that we saw to begin with, and that comes from what we know from the psychological evidence, that if we talk about creating sort of a climate of legitimacy, that this would likely produce more cooperation, including by people from the very groups who may themselves see themselves as the target of uh, increased policing efforts. I think that is... Uh, is a winning point, uh, it's a winning point across the board, and it would uh, create the kind of climate that would then produce uh, enthusiasm, as Hugh uh, wondered why it wasn't there, also then for civilian uh, oversight of some sort. Um, subject to my earlier caveat about there, there is no sort of protection for things like privacy and the information sharing um, uh, provisions here. We need to take that into account seriously. Layering oversight on top of that is, is not necessarily going to get you very much. But if we want to talk about oversight, I think if you're going to share information with 17 recipient um, organizations, you need to understand that only a few of them have any kind of um, uh, review uh, that happens, right? We have CSE, CSIS, the RCMP, but there's a number of these institutions where there's just no oversight um, of, of any kind. And so something, some kind of integrated oversight there has to happen. Part um, uh, review for sure, but I actually like um, Kent Roach and Craig Forsese's sort of super circ um, uh, proposal because there's a lot that's very technical in this too, um, and having a standard kind of body with more expertise would be very useful. Well, I, <clears throat> I think we need a, a radical overhaul of the whole oversight, review, and accountability process with regard to all the security intelligence agencies in Canada. Uh, starting first and foremost with CSE, given the enormous power and capabilities that they have that have gone under the radar for so long behind a black curtain of secrecy, it's time to open that up and subject it to a mature debate about what are the proper limits to that type of power in a liberal democratic society. Unfortunately, with, with this bill, we, we have 21st century threats, but we're designing 1940s era security services to deal with them. And I think that's not the way to go. Uh, we're better than that. And um, I think Kent Roach said something about Justice O'Connor and the, the idea that you have this compartmentalization of, of review and oversight mechanisms across all of these different agencies. Uh, that needs to change. I, I think we need to address that. And hopefully events like this will, will help prompt that. Thank you. And would you all please join me in thanking our panel for a very frank and direct. Well, thank you all very, very much. It's been a, a very long day for, uh, for some of you. There have been people who've been here uh, right from 8.45 this morning, and I uh, have been asked to do a... Uh, set of closing reflections. Uh, my first reflection is to say thank you for those of you who have uh, stuck with us through uh, some very, very detailed uh, and I think exciting conversations. I also, of course, want to thank my colleagues from the law faculty, especially Dean Ed Iacobucci, for the collaboration that we've had uh, in putting this uh, set of panels together. I also want to stand up for retired judges. Um, <laughs> Some of them are pretty feisty, and I, I don't know. I, th I think we gave them a, a bit of a rough ride. Not seriously. On the uh, review front, I'm uh, very much aligned with the uh, worries that people expressed. I'm not going to try and provide a uh, summary of today's discussions. They were too complicated, too rich. Uh, instead, I'd like to just provide a few uh, summary reflections uh, on some themes that I think emerged in the conversation. Uh, first, I was delighted uh, that we started with a good critical approach, which didn't even accept the premise of the argument that after the Paris attacks was a moment of inflection. There was some debate about that. Uh, we assumed that, I think, in putting together uh, these panels, uh, and it was suggested that perhaps it was only an inflection point uh, for some Western countries, but didn't have a broader impact. And it was also suggested that it was uh, a misconceived inflection point. The question was asked, why didn't we respond in the same way after Anders Breivik killed young social democrats uh, on an island uh, in, uh, off Sweden? Uh, 
Uh, very fair questions, I think. Uh, I will say we had exactly the same set of questions after the attacks of September 11th. Was this really a changed world? Uh, claims uh, to the uh, positive and to the negative. I'm going to suggest that I think it is an inflection point for, uh, I think, five reasons. First, uh, there's no doubt that the attacks in Paris and uh, their uh, immediate aftermath generated widespread public reactions, typically in Western countries. Secondly, I think that the attacks have opened up arguments for increased surveillance, for criminal law and security responses by governments. Uh, this is not new, but I think that that discourse has been heightened. Thirdly, I think it's fair to say that these attacks have prompted fear in minority communities in Europe in particular, particularly uh, Muslims, but also Jews. This whole question about uh, balancing of liberty and security, which was uh, noted as, uh, as a typical uh, Western response, uh, presupposes that we're balancing on the backs of certain people. I'm not going to bear very much balancing on my back. But if I'm a young Muslim, especially a male Muslim, I might be bearing quite a lot of that balancing. And so the question of how equality fits in uh, to that discourse is, I think, important. I think it's also an inflection point because we are encouraged to take a longer view. Perhaps not to see this as a turning point, but as an accretion ratcheting up pressures on our society to respond. And that goes to the last point, which I think our media panel captured well, but uh, came up in a number of different el elements of the discourse today. An exacerbation of the tendency to require decisive action for the media to report immediately and to leap to analysis. And I think uh, it was commented that as soon as that happened, there were huge generalizations that became very difficult to sustain. And so we often get wrong-headed policy responses as well. Now, having said all of that, it is absolutely true, and this is another theme, it's complicated. It's hard to tease out the effects of these attacks from other elements of social pressure, from other elements of social, economic, and cultural evolution. It's very hard to understand cause and effect. In Europe, especially in the UK and France, uh, it was pointed out that there are long-term effects of colonialism. Who is it that actually immigrates to these countries? What are the education levels? What's the receptivity to integration? There's a lot of language then about root causes, languages that's very hard to tease out. There are so many different root causes, economic, political, social. Often they interplay one with another. There's not a lot of discourse about that in Canada, perhaps uh, a greater de degree of comfort on immigration policies over time, but I do think uh, that those tough sets of interrelated questions are definitely preoccupying our friends in Europe. Notions of radicalization, also highly complicated, not entirely due to local conditions, it was pointed out. There are global extremist movements, and these are often beyond the reach, easily, of local interventions because of the power of the Internet and the images that can be conveyed. We had questions then that were also complicated about the role of the media in holding groups accountable. It was suggested that we are pretty comfortable in holding politicians accountable, but not so comfortable in holding community leaders accountable. Is the media afraid, not just potentially of insulting uh, communities, but actually afraid of the response that may be generated, physically afraid? There may also be in that, it was suggested, an erasure of certain categories of people because of the media's interest in getting the tough reaction, let's say from an imam, rather than from a secular Muslim woman. How do we go about dealing with that? We also had a debate about how we understand the very notion of a commitment to civility in public discourse. Are we, in the way we craft our arguments, actually setting up an uncivil alternative? 
the not us, those who were, of course, not civilized. Is there room for debate around what's sensible and fair-minded in a set of limitations on free speech? We had one proposal for a harm-based principle read in specific contexts, and the specific context point came up again and again and again throughout the day. No general theoretical approaches are likely to be successful, simply trying to declare a balance between religious rights and free speech is not likely to take you very far, because people experience those balances differently. If you're a religious minority, you don't experience that balance in the same way as a member of a religious majority or a non-religious person. Power differentials really matter, we were told again and again. It was also commented that in the West we've had a privatization of religion, uh, which actually doesn't make sense for some religious traditions, which are essentially public traditions. So it seems to me that you put all of that complexity together, and one of the elements that we have to try to address is not so much the direct effects of the attack, but the effects of our responses to the attacks. Are we unintentionally criminalizing certain forms of religious belief? Are we sometimes potentially forcing people to reject faith or be suspect. Is there space left for what one of our panelists called a critical middle in Western Islam itself? It was also pointed out that in the promise of liberal democracy and the promise of equality, which we hold out to immigrant communities in particular, if we fail in delivering by failing to integrate economically, socially, we may be setting up deep sources, deep pools of anger, claims of hypocrisy in the second generation, which might help to explain some of these cases of people who look like they're more like us, finding radical Islam to be attractive. It was also said that it's very hard to disentangle national or domestic and global approaches especially if we treat everything as an undifferentiated war on terror? Do we care that the response within Canada might have to be different from a response in Iraq to ISIS? The point about ISIS raises a further observation, that it's becoming particularly difficult to predict the effects of jihadists who seek to control territory. This is a new phenomenon in some ways in the global uh, terrorism context. So there's a blending of the role of the territorially rooted, almost a traditional state system, and the remarkable ability of jihadist websites, etc., to penetrate uh, into every cultural context. I think all of this uh, leads us to ask some very hard questions about our more immediate responses within Canada, and that was very much the focus of parts of this afternoon. We might, and we were reminded of our own failures in the past, internment of Japanese, German, Canadians. We were reminded as well of some of the excesses at the time of the implementation of the War Measures Act, the role of the RCMP. We were reminded about the more than 400 uh, people who were arrested, many with absolutely no charges ever laid, and in fact, no real uh, data linking them to any risk. So Canadians are not exempt from this. Question, are we going to look back in 10 years, or 20 years, or 50 years, and ask whether or not we've made the right choices, even within Bill C-51? We heard about a wide-ranging ban on speech promoting terrorism offenses in general. Perhaps uh, a worry that this will have a chilling effect, that it's overreach. Speech which actually poses no threat may fall perversely within the context of this legislation. We heard about the broad definition of security interest in the information sharing components of the bill a very ill-defined concept, we were told. We heard about the potential to violate charter rights to disrupt activities with judicial pre-authorization. 
that's quite a dramatic decision on the part of legislatures, potentially. So there's close, we were told, to a blank check here. Also a ramping up of the security service powers to disrupt more generally. Then we were treated to a discussion around the wide availability uh, to security agencies of uh, data collection techniques from across government. Very expansive provisions that allow for people's data to be collected from wherever it is entered into a governmental system. And then to connect that data with foreign partners. Privacy uh, protections, we were told, were actually largely exempted from that data sharing. Finally, uh, on the immediate issues, we had a good discussion, I thought, about weak and ineffective accountability or oversight regimes in the Canadian context generally for our security services. We also heard that we haven't had official inquiries into, for example, what happened in Ottawa. Everything remains within the secret purview of the security services. We heard about the need for sunset clauses, which of course do exist in current legislation and are not included in the new legislation, or even legislative review. So it was pointed out that this is an omnibus piece of legislation which affects many other pieces of legislation, and yet there seems to be an assumption that we're going to get it right first time out. I would point out that Canada is generally weak on legislative review mechanisms uh, when you compare us to other parliamentary democracies and to the United States. And this is an interesting phenomenon here, and it was pointed out very forcefully. We don't have the capacity for oversight that exists, for example, in the reviews of parliamentary committees within the United Kingdom. Our committees are not empowered, they have no money, they have almost no staff, and they can't actually ask the hard questions that I think we would all say should be asked in a democratic society, no matter what you believe is the right balance ultimately. And I think that was made clear by our panels. Finally, I do want to point out some areas of of potential hope, because there was a lot of pessimism today, uh, quite explicit pessimism. First, I'll say, I think that there is a widespread acceptance that there are genuine risks that we face as a society. There are people who want to damage our society, and there are people who feel particularly vulnerable. Jews in Europe right now express that vulnerability, and not just in France, but in uh, the United Kingdom especially. We've heard that a majority of Canadians seem to feel a sense of vulnerability. So there is at least a consensus that there is risk. I would also say that there's a a consensus that we heard today, at least, that the principle of equality of citizenship is important to Canadians. Now, equality of citizenship does not mean absolute uniformity. It simply means that we are trying to create a society where citizens are not fundamentally treated in different ways because of their categorization. I would say there was also a fair amount of consensus that we do need to move beyond tolerance to genuine inclusion in our societies, economic, social, and cultural inclusion, an ever-expanding notion of we, I think, came through in many of the presentations. Now, we also were told we better ask some hard questions about means, not just about ends. In other words, yes, we accept there's risk. Yes, we accept that we're trying to achieve uh, greater security in that uh, risk environment. But we better think about what the means are in how we respond. And in many ways, that was the whole afternoon's discussion. Are we getting the means right? I think we also heard that we need to give ourselves some time to learn some lessons of history, even of recent experience. We didn't get everything right in the last major omnibus piece of legislation in relation to security. We've learned from the Senate Review Committee in the United States that that country didn't get everything right post-September 11th, 
and the creation of expanded security powers. And we heard it clearly. We heard happily after the War Measures Act, there was an inquiry which told us some of the things that happened with the RCMP. We have learned, but we don't always apply those learnings very well because sometimes we don't give ourselves the time. So at the end of the day, we clearly are facing an extraordinarily complex set of issues. We didn't all agree on exactly what the right responses would be, but I do think that we did trace out some lines, if carefully pursued, that could lead us to a better place than we are potentially facing right now. Finally, I do want to say that I give the uh, Image of the Day Award to Ron Debert. I loved the notion of digital exhaust and the idea that we all are emitting digital exhaust constantly in our lives now and that it can be picked up, tracked, bundled, sold, and can result in reductions to our sense of privacy and liberty. Again, I want to thank you all for being here today. I'm going to turn the podium over to uh, my colleague, uh, Dean Ed Iacobucci, to say a final word on behalf of all of us. Thank you very much. As, as Stephen said, it's, it's been a long day, uh, a rich day, uh, and so I will, I will be brief. Um, I just want to start with a couple of remarks on Stephen's remarks. Uh, first, uh, uh, to second his concerns about the bashing of retired judges, something that I feel is a filial obligation with a uh, father who, was a who is a retired judge. But secondly, I want to, uh, Stephen began by saying he wasn't going to summarize because it would be impossible to summarize the day's content. And then he proceeded to provide a masterful summary of the day's content. But to the extent that he didn't uh, provide a complete summary of today's content, I think it's because, uh, as a colleague said, and it's been a theme, it's complicated. There's, and, and when um, we were in some ways inspired uh, to, to host this conference, when Stephen approached me about doing so, we thought about some of the successes of other events like this, including one shortly on the heels of September 11th. Um, where there was a conference organized around B Bill C-36. Uh, the contrast between that event and this um, is that we thought it would be very important to take the multidisciplinary approach, not just to focus on the legal questions that the bill raised, but to focus on the broader questions uh, that certainly the Paris attacks themselves raise and the aftermath raises. So one way to think about it is that the, 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 the premise of Paris being a motivating uh, event uh, was challenged early on, and I thought in, in an interesting way. I think one can also take issue with the premise of the multidisciplinary approach as well. And so uh, I think it's very clearly embedded in the way the program was set up that we think this is a complicated question. Simple answers, either with the law or either with developments in security, developments in military, aren't going to be solutions here. And the program, I think, reflected that. So I'm, I'm, I'm delighted at the kind of uh, cooperation across the university uh, that this conference pulled together. Um, but I'm also delighted to get contributions, our media panel being a, a high point of this, but to contributions from Hugh Siegel, Louis Frechette, and others uh, to come in and w to bring into the university uh, their perspectives uh, hard won out there in the, the sort of real world, as we sometimes put it. So I think this has been a very successful day. So thank you to the team at Monk. Thank you to the team at Law who helped organize it. Um, there will be a volume put together, uh, panelists. Thank you for your contributions. Now the written work follows. Uh, we'll expect that within a week. We're trying to put this book together in, for, uh, in academic terms, lightning speed. For uh, journalist terms, a luxurious time frame. Uh, and, uh, but look for that very soon uh, from the University of Toronto Press. So thank you, thank you again to our panelists, uh, our organizers, and thank you all for being here. Thanks. Thanks.